So welcome to the Red to Black podcast with your host Warner and Mario. And today we have a special guest, Peter Harrigan. He's been a derivatives trader in the capital markets for many years. And Peter, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Warner. I appreciate it. Uh, so just, I guess, a quick background. Um, I've been in capital markets uh, for quite a while. I started um, with doing a um, an arbitrage strategy that some friends of mine and I developed in college. And we went to Chicago and started trading that in the late 80s. Uh, and then I ended up on the trading floor in Chicago, trading um, currency options for a number of years, and then went out to San Francisco and traded equity options um, during the uh, during the internet boom, one, during one of our, our many booms and busts we've had. Um, and I was in that business for a while until basically being a, a floor trader was not such a, a good good place to be. Um, and then about 2007, I was one of the founders of a company that was called Sentient Technologies. Um, this was an evolutionary learning technology that we were applying to capital markets, essentially um, evolving uh, short-term trading strategies. Um, so I came in with, I, I like to say I was the fourth most important out of four founders um, coming in with mostly capital markets knowledge. Um, so I gave gave that system um, information on inputs and then also information on um, ideas on exactly how we should structure the the fitness function of the evolution. Um, I was there for about six years. I had an okay exit uh, for, for once, which was nice. Um, and then after that, I started getting interested in what was going on in the crypto space and started going to some of the, the early um, Ethereum meetups. Uh, so that was, you know, the stuff down in Silicon Valley in 2014 and 15. Um, as a result of doing that, I got involved in the Ethereum ICO, but not nearly as big as I should have. Um, but that was that was helpful. And then also ran into uh, the person who's now my partner on the business that we're building right now. And so I've been kind of the last few years has been some investing uh, in, in the crypto space and then also helping working on building a, a new product which is a decentralized derivatives exchange um, that is extremely easy for people to use and which hopefully we'll be launching in a few months. Wow, Peter, that's fascinating. It sounds like your your whole trajectory has been one of this high energy. You've been in the on the the floor of of, you know, the Chicago Stock Exchange, then out to San Francisco and for most people I've been researching this, there's not many stock traders left. It's all digitized right now. So that's that was a pretty cool experience. And then you jumped into technology and, and kind of caught that wave up. And now you're really jumping into what, what's the next frontier, which is Bitcoin. And it mm -hmm. seems like you, you really are on the edge sort of of the pulse in these different areas. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I've occasionally been on the edge and occasionally been just a little <laughs> bit shy of the edge. But, you know, it's, it's, it's worked out in general. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So... So yeah, let's get started. We have three questions we're going to go over today. The first one is a question my co-host came up with, which is, will AI eliminate private transactions? And what we mean by that is, will AI sort of track everything you're doing and potentially control it? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think um, I can definitely say from having been at an AI company that uh, that there's a lot of kind of hype around AI and people think it can do more than it can do. But one thing that it is very good at is recognizing patterns, right? So going through all that data and, and, and finding patterns in people's spendings and people's activity um, is definitely kind of the sweet spot for, for a lot of the, the AI that exists, right? Um, I mean, I can really only speak to the area I was involved in which was an evolutionary learning technology. And I was not one of the AI people. I was just as involved in it and, and helping like craft where we were going with it. Um, so my knowledge is obviously limited to that particular area, but I can definitely say that the ability to find these kinds of patterns in a lot of data is, is, is fairly strong. Um, I think the real question is who's using it, right? So, <clears throat> you know, these big centralized entities um, that are collecting all this information on you, right? And um, I was, you know, you, you look at the Googles and the Facebooks and then all the financial institutions. Um, so to me, it's less a question of whether the the AI has the capable, capability of, of, you know, breaking through your privacy as, you know, who who is who is collecting it? And why, you know, when you have these big central entities, it's kind of, it is kind of scary that they have that, 
that they have that and that they are they are tracking you, right? I mean, we know that they're that they're they're watching what you do. I think everybody's had the everybody's had the experience, right? Where you're you're in a room and you're talking about something, some topic yeah. or whatever, and you pick your phone up and all of a sudden there's an ad for the thing you talk, you know, that you were talking about. <laughs> I know, it's wild. Right. And then they say, Oh, you know, your 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 speaker's off, but they have these the ability with these things to like you know, like wake up, you should be able to go, Hey, I, you know, I, w- I want to start talking to you now. And it's like, well, how does that work if the microphone's really off? And of course we know these things aren't off. So there's a lot that's tracking us all the time. And, and then, you know, they can, they can get a lot of information from what they found. Um, I think one, one, uh, quick example I can think of when I was at Sentient, um, we were evolving these little trading patterns and we had just purchased a new data set. And it was very early in the company's history and we were not as well capitalized at that point. And so we bought a a less expensive data set. And um, what we found is very, very quickly, the little evolutionary learning, uh, the little evolutionary uh, bots, I guess you could call them, had evolved to find this really, really profitable strategy. And what we discovered was that in fact, what they found was flaws in the data set. So there's this massive data set with, you know, millions and millions of points of data. And they had found the data that was wrong really, really quickly because it created what was a sort of an illusory profit opportunity. Um, And then we were able to sort that out and figure it out. But we did, we found those little tiny bits of data that were wrong um, insanely quickly just because the technology was evolving to use them. So yeah, this kind of stuff, I mean, you know, going through all your personal data and everyone else's, uh, definitely the capabilities are there. Yeah. So those those are really interesting insights. And I keep hearing that from other individuals that we interview is that we kind of put this, this start kind of like really like this, this mindset on this AI, like it's so powerful, but where it is right now, it's, it's just collate, collating and filtering data. And it seems to me, will that, will that help businesses improve their profit margins? Will that help other businesses like restaurant businesses that have notoriously bad margins? I mean, I'm talking about not the McDonald's, which have great margins, but these, right, these younger, because right. they have these franchise models that they've worked out and the margins are really good because it's all efficient. Mm-hmm. Do you think AI, because right. on this channel, we're focused on supporting people and finding these highly profitable businesses. Do you think AI, because it can gather this data and sort the data, do you think it can make some of these really low margin businesses, better margin businesses in the future? I think it could for a really large or in, you know, really large organization, right? Someone who can really leverage that, um, that advantage. Uh, it's hard to see where with a smaller business, right? Like a restaurant, um, how they're going to get that information. Um, you know, you know, I mean, I guess if, if it's information that, that other people aren't looking for, right. If they've, if they've got a specific informational need that would help them, but it's not something that's going to help, um, you know, another larger organization Then I think possibly, but I think, you know, the real, um, you know, the, what I would really think you're going to see more of is just, you know, more of these sort of centralized entities that, you know, they get that information and they're going to use it, you know, to their advantage. Um, Maybe I would, you know, I don't know. It's also, you think about like some of these restaurant groups that are more capitalized, they're going to be able to do that. That's, it's an interesting question. And I, I wish I knew more about, you know, that particular, that particular business to be able to give you a, a more coherent Yeah, what's, what's interesting though, is you kind of touched on something. It's like AI requires a certain amount of computing power. So there's a business model behind AI. So you really, you really just talked about it. It's like, will the smaller guys really have access to this data, who knows? Probably not. It's probably going to be the bigger guys, the centralized guys that are going to use it against. As you're seeing right now, you know, in these these shutdowns, the smaller businesses. I mean, I'm in LA, and you go through Beverly Hills. On I'm talking about some of the best real estate in the world, and there's vacant vacant right. building on Rodeo Drive. I saw a few vacant. That would never have happened. Oh sure. Oh sure. So right. in this shutdown. <clears throat> A lot of these small businesses were wiped away, but then the Amazons and the bigger businesses were allowed to operate. So you have these, like what what you're saying is where we're kind of going is 
the individuals that have access to the AI, I never thought about that, will, will be the ones who are going to be able to collate the data, filter the data, and then see the inefficiencies and, and pos- probably use that against these smaller businesses. They're going to say, hey, there's a gap with this business here. Let's hit them here. So that's, that's definitely going to be a challenge. I kind of wonder, like, what are the areas that the big guys aren't interested in, right? And you mentioned, like, the large franchises. Um, and, and so obviously they're, you know, they're very, they have a very different interest in, in data than someone who has a, an individual restaurant, right? So you have to think what's the niche that the, you know, that that small restaurant is filling. I would assume it has to do with more of a personalized service and quality of what they're you're creating. And then obviously the location in which they, they exist. So that might be something that, you know, you can't, you can't do on a mass scale. Right. So then a McDonald's or whatever, some of these large people, they don't care. Right. That's not something that they can op- they can work with. Right. I mean, they always that was one of the things I always talked about with like free trade and, you know, these, you know, international trades like you can't outsource like a haircut. Right. So, you know, your barber is going to still be open, but, you know, uh, large manufacturing, you certainly can outsource. So it, it, I guess it depends. There's this big divergence in the kind of business we're talking about, something where it's small and it's personal. But then if it is small and it's about the personal touch, is there something, I mean, is there a need for AI in that situation? And I mean, honestly, I don't know, uh, but, but there might be, uh, and there might be something that they can find out about their customers. Um, yeah. That some of these smaller people can use. Yeah. And what's, what's interesting in that is going along this privacy route, what may end up happening is these larger businesses have these booking systems, right? Everything's, so say for a smaller haircut or where they would tie in, it's a booking system, a POS system, a account, accounting system. So maybe where we're talking about freedom here, maybe the barber does things a different way. He doesn't agree to, you know, doing such and such and such, which is a dictate of the state. Maybe that's how AI, because the thing I've seen, which is challenging, will be challenged for these small businesses, especially on LinkedIn, other platforms, people are getting kicked off, but it's usually probably the algorithm saying you, you did X, Y, or Z. And then it goes to a board of people who go and review and the individual gets reinstated. So I think that could be the challenge, which is, is obviously there's a personal freedoms, everything that you that you're transmitting is being tracked and monitored, but there's also these small businesses, they could get caught in these kind of these like dungeons because AI is putting them there and they're like, well, we never meant to do that. So I think that could be a challenge for small business. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think the, the scariest thing, I mean, it, it, it's funny because we talk about AI and we talk about all these kind of new technologies, but like you just mentioned it, what has been the biggest threat to these people? And it's a government dictate that, they, you know, you have to shut down. I mean, and that's not exactly a, a high tech tool, right? I mean, that's a very low tech thing where they just come in and say, all right, well, you can't operate your business, you know, until we tell you. And so, um, I mean, you know, the, I think the biggest threat areas, um, you know, is, is it is it really, you know, artificial intelligence and all that data or is it actually a situation where it's just government mandates um, and then money and the fact, you know, uh, the fact that they can, you know, the, the government can print however much money they want. We seem to keep accepting it. And uh, and and then they, you know, they can continue to operate. Um, I mean, certainly if we had. Uh, like a, you know, currency the way we used to have, uh, there would be limits on what the government could do here because there'd be limits on how much revenue they could collect, right? And now when we've separated money from the actual tax base, um, they do not seem to be limited in the same way. I mean, can can you imagine having the shutdowns that we've had over the last year and a half if uh, the government had to actually borrow each of those dollars, not from the Federal Reserve, not from itself, essentially, but from, you know, individual lenders. Uh, I mean, that, that, that could, none of this could happen. What I think we're dealing with is we have an entity which is, which is just printing money out of space. So they're devaluing the currency. And, and then they're sinking all these small businesses and they're going to say the solution is get everyone on this digital system. Well, now these small businesses are tied to an entity that doesn't have a lot of responsibility that can now control it electronically. So there's no, there's no like letter coming. There's no phone call. It's like literally 
your account, I think that's the challenge with AI. When AI gets into the mix and why a lot of people like Bitcoin is it like, it depends on who's writing the rules for the AI. So as this, for, for these small businesses that are, that are building themselves, even if they have a, see, back in the day, if a business had a great margin, that was their margin of safety. And that's what saved them. But nowadays, you have to take into account this other entity, which is like this government or outside force. That's another issue that could shut me down. And that, that's something that I think that it doesn't matter how profitable you are if, you're, if your business is shut down. Yeah. Oh, right. If they just shut the door. Right, right. I mean, this is, <clears throat> this is kind of, I mean, you know, what, what I've been working on, pardon me, <clears throat> for a long time is risk. And I think the biggest, you know, issue is people think they know what, um, they, they think they know what risks they're up against based on what their past experience has been, right? And so we, you know, yeah, and so, yeah, we try to, we try to analyze it. We try to make it mathematical. And we look at a lot of data and stuff. And then something new comes along where it's, it's so they just say, oh, you know, you're, you're shut down. And you look at some of these platforms that have been shutting people down. You look at the, I mean, you, you know, it, it, these risks are outside of the scope of what people thought risk was, right? These are not, these are not things that people had any reason looking at past experience to expect what, you know, was, was the risk. Now, um, I mean, that's been true for a long time in, I mean, in the financial world, um, the, you know, the, this is all based in a, the, a lot of the systems that we have for managing risk, for managing the markets are based on, you know, looking at past data, uh, analyzing it in a statistical manner, coming back and saying, well, you know, uh, this is a one standard deviation move. So if it, you know, if we assume it won't move more than three standard deviations and then we're safe. And um, they just don't build in for completely unexpected and completely, you know, completely unexpected, unanticipated sort of movements that can happen. And just like that's happening with, with, you know, real businesses in the physical world, somebody comes along and says it's shut down. Or like you just mentioned, um, being in an area where you'd expect that's a great business, right? So you're not the business on Rodeo Drive that got shut down. You're the restaurant that sold to the people who worked in that business. And, and so, I mean, like, you know, I, I'm, you know, have been living in San Francisco for the last 20 years with the exception of the last few months. Um, the financial district is just a ghost town. And so think about all the businesses that were there. So, you know, they, they thought, well, you know, what if there's a downturn in the economy? What if we can't get our, you know, our, the food that we're going to serve shipped in? What if prices change? All these kinds of things like, well, now uh, you have no customers. Not, and you have no customers, nothing to do with you, nothing to do with, you know, a change in the GDP. Just the fact that no one's working out of an office anymore. I mean, who saw that coming? Who saw no one going into an office? So, yeah, so those are great points because it builds on what I was saying, which is you can have a high profit margin business, but if you have no revenue, you, you don't have a business. So it's kind of like when you're looking, another caveat right. to add, and this, is, this has gone out throughout our entire history of the world is, you know, from capitalism to socialism to communism, it just goes up that chain to where you're, you're going from individual liberties to a few people controlling the system. And what you basically get in the end right. is it's, it's either two systems. It's either more towards independent or more towards a few people controlling it. And we know how that turns out. So the challenge, I guess, for people investing in businesses nowadays or building your own business, the thing that you have to bake into your formula is, am I in an environment where I'm going to get shut down or am I an Oracle where I can just shift my servers to different, or I have like, if you right. look at Amazon, they have multiple redundant servers. If you set up, spin up a server on one of their, on AWS, you can set up servers all over the world. A company like Oracle is like, all right, San Francisco's right. not working. I'm going to go to Bloomfield, Colorado, where I, I saw a huge headquarters they had there or down to Austin, Texas, where they move their headquarters. So, I think right. really analyzing when you're buying a business or building a business, the mobility of that business is essential seeing what we just saw in the past year or two. Right. Well, absolutely. And if you look at something like um, real estate, 
uh, I mean, you know, it's been a very good business and certainly you would expect when they're printing a lot of money that the value of those physical assets is going to go up, certainly in terms of those dollars. Um, but at the same time, you know, the real estate, it's, it's location based and it's in, and so whether or not that, you know, location will continue to be a, a profitable one is in the hands of, of people that aren't, you know, that aren't you and that aren't the general conditions. And you sort of, so you look at that and think, well, you know, how much can they tax it? Uh, can they actually come in and confiscate it? I mean, certainly not at this stage, but do we, you know, can we really say that can't happen? I mean, I, it's really hard to look at anything and say, well, that's a ridiculous scenario anymore because after what we've seen in the last year, uh, you know, I, boy, I, I hope, you know, we look back at a few years and say, okay, all of our crazy sort of doomsday thoughts about this were wrong because it all calmed down and all went back to normal. But, um, you know, you do have to, you do have to plan for things that you that just don't think can possibly happen anymore. And, and so you're right. I mean, another, another way of thinking about it is, um, do you have a lot of variable versus fixed costs, right? So, uh, you know, <clears throat> certainly a lot of businesses, you know, people are trying to lower their costs, but a lot of times what they aren't really thinking about is how do I, how do I make it so that my costs can vary if all, you know, can, can, can decrease rapidly if my revenue decreases rapidly. Right. And so, uh, you know, obviously again, you go and think about real estate, most of those costs are, are pretty well fixed. Um, you know, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know how people are getting through the, this, you know, eviction moratorium. Right. I mean, I know there's people, small people out there who aren't collecting rent and I don't know how they're, how they're getting by it because I assume they're having to make the payments, you know, their payments are, there's no moratorium on those. Yeah. It's, I, I can actually give you a real world example because we yeah. were in, Lo in Los Angeles. We have a fourplex, which we just sold about five, a week ago. Uh -huh. And, and before this whole scenario happened, with these shutdowns, Mario, the other co-host, we would always talk about like, hey, this government is spending recklessly. We're going to have a huge economic crash. And Mario's like, do you want to be in a line with all the other renters trying to get money back from renters that you can't get out? So right. we had actually been doing Airbnb at the time. We, it's a fourplex at a house, which was mm -hmm. had a high paying tenant. And how we dealt with, with the strategy, there's a multi, multiple prong strategy we use. We use Airbnb. Mm -hmm. to, to get, actually it was overnight rentals. And then as you know, LA, San Francisco, they kinked it. And now right. they said you could only do 30 days. So as right. a business owner, we saw this firsthand. So right. we went to 30 days. And what actually ended up happening, a great strategy in this moratorium, was we only had one month vacant throughout the entire really? moratorium because we were going into the furnished mar market, furnished rentals marketplace. Oh, okay. And most yeah, people don't, but it was 30 days plus. So it was a different clientele. It was like nurses, professionals versus the overnight furnished rentals, which is a hotel. Right. That got, that got kanked. But we kind of got lucky. But it was also foresight. So really with a lot of this real estate is this foresight. But at the same time, uh, people in my family, I won't mention names, they're still kind of thinking how you were talking about, which is from the past. Right. Thinking like, oh, prices are going to still go up in the future. But what if they shut it down again? What if you go to refinance off a bridge loan and your current interest rates, which they're arbitrarily holding down, are right. now spiking through the roof? So that's why I'm transitioning more to building this financial podcast and a private equity business in some other types like alcohol, chocolate space, which has got higher margins. Right. <laughs> I don't, people always want alcohol and chocolate. No, that sounds, yeah, yeah. That sounds good. So, so, but yeah, I firsthand know the challenge of real estate because when you have an environment where individuals, governments are, don't have your back, right? It, it's, I mean, you can just see how it can go awry really quickly. Well, I think the other thing is, um, <clears throat> you, you, you know, people have a tendency to say, well, what, what are the, you know, two or three rules that I need to follow and what's the strategy I need to employ? And then just expect that they're going to be able to keep doing it forever. And, you know, it's just the, you know, the, the space is too fluid, right? Everything is changing all the time. And you go through these sort of, you know, calm, steady periods and, uh, and then all, you know, everyone thinks everything's fine. And then it, and then it, you know, it, gets upended. And so, you know, what you're talking about makes a lot of sense. I mean, but you have to be ready to make that shift. And I think a lot of people might look at what you just described and said, maybe it's too risky for us to change what we've been doing. Right. But inst instead, but the risk was to not change clearly. 
So, I mean, uh, th there's that, you know, there's that outlook that people have um, where you think, well, you know, I've, I've had a thing, it's worked and I don't want to try anything new because, you know, that, that, that's a risk because I don't know, I guess it's an unknown, but boy, you know, not being willing to take risk can be, you know, quite risky itself. Yeah. So on that note of, of risk going into question number two, how do you, since you were in the derivatives market, for so long, how do you deal with risk in that market? That, that's a fascinating question for me. I know I know derivatives at a basic level, but I sure heck don't know it at your level. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think you know. I mean, there's obviously like personal financial risk, and then there's sort of systemic risk in the in the space. And that and the derivatives area has always had uh, a certain amount of, of systemic risk. Um, the, the the system as it exists right now is built on essentially leveraging uh, assets that, you know, do not have a limit on their price. Uh, I mean, and, and this this comes up every, you know, 10 years or something like that. You get something that's totally unexpected. Um, you look at like uh, the 2008 crash where everyone kind of modeled it based on what kind of foreclosures had happened in the past, what, what had occurred, uh, um, you know, to the past in real estate. And they thought, well, then we can just project that out into the future. And it turned out obviously to be dramatically incorrect. Um, and I mean, you look at something like oil futures that, uh, just last, I guess what, about 14 months ago, last May, the um, the price of the front month oil futures went below zero, and went to actually negative. And I remember look I remember looking at it that day, and it, the price dropped to a dollar, and you know it certainly made sense with the shutdowns coming. And then the price went below a dollar, and I thought uh, maybe you know maybe first thought was hey maybe I should buy some, and I thought well if it's trading here there's probably something I don't know, there's probably something going on that I don't know about, and of course. Um, you know, I had never been an oil trader, so I'd never really looked into the details of the contract, but you know, that what it turns out was there was no, you know, there was no downside bound to the price. So you had a situation where, uh, you know, people did not want to own those contracts because if they took delivery, there was no place that they could store it. So it actually made sense for someone to pay, to sell the product at a negative price because you were, you were pushing the uh, need to store that actual that commodity onto someone else, and it was actually worthwhile to uh, sell it at negative ten dollars a barrel just to get it pushed onto someone else. Well, if you're in that contract, if you're trading the you know oil futures, and you're thinking, well, I'm I'm protecting myself, I'm hedging myself against you know energy prices going up in the future, or I'm speculating on oil prices. Um, when you you put up you put up margin and you think oh this is how much I can lose this is the most I can lose on that contract, uh, and and then you find out that in fact the amount you can lose is is quite a bit quite a bit larger than you ever you know anticipated, and why is that? And that's because all of these things are built on just leveraging things that don't have any kind of um, they don't have any kind of uh, cap to how far the price can move. There's no cap and no floor. I mean, you can buy options, right? You buy a put option and now you've got a, there's a, there's a, a floor under your price, but that just pushes the, uh, the, the unlimited risk onto somebody else because somebody had to sell you that option. So you're either in a futures contract or you're in a swap or something, or you're in an option. And then one side of the option trade has to have an unlimited risk. Um, so the underlying, you know, part of, you know, the way this, that business has been built is again, to look at historical data and to say, well, how much can this move based on the historical data? And that's where you run into, you run into problems because, you know, people think, well, we have a big enough margin of safety built into, into this. Um, I think the, the most recent and kind of fun and crazy example was what happened in GameStop, right? Where they actually had to halt the trading of these of some of the stocks based on you know all these people flooding in and buying them, and um, I you know I, I I think about trading options for a long time. And people, when I was on the trading floor, there were always guys who would sell like an out of the money option. They'd sell like the this you know the call like a think of a stock example. The stocks at a hundred bucks, and somebody would sell the three hundred dollar call that expired in two weeks. 
well, I mean, that's not going to, that's not going to come into the money. That's never going to be a problem. So they sell it for a nickel or something like that. And they go, that's free money. I put it in my back pocket. I already, I made that money. There's no way anything can go wrong. Well, then you have a situation like that where there are a bunch of people short the stock. And as the, as, as the price, as buyers are coming in and people are buying the stock and the price of the stock goes up, those people who are short have to turn around and start buying it back, then they become the buyers, then they're pushing the price up. And if you're short the option, um, you know, you think, well, I don't need to hedge it because it's you know so far in the money. All of a sudden that option starts going up in price. You think, well, maybe I should buy some shares of stock against the option. So you buy some, you've driven the price up higher. And, and then, you know, now it's a more expensive option as a higher delta. You have to start thinking, well, now I need to buy more stock to hedge it. And so you, you create these self perpetuating cycles, um, where, and I've seen it a number of times with people who are short options in a market and they think they know what's going to happen. And then they end up being the, being the driver of the move that's killing them. Uh, I remember seeing it on the floor of the P coast in 2000, there was a stock and, you know, it split four to one and the guys who were short the options didn't realize just how badly that was going to hurt them. And they had to be buying stock against options. They were short. And as they did it, they drove the price up and then it made them even bigger losers. So in the case of GameStop, you had a situation where Robin Hood and some of the other guys had to, they had to stop the trading in it. They had to say to people, you can't buy anymore, right? GameStop was where the Wall Street bets people were coming in. I'm, not, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Robin Hood was where the Wall Street bets people were coming in and trading that. They had to say, you have to stop, you know, you have to stop buying the stock because at, at this point they were driving the price to where the shorts were losing billions of dollars. Um, and that's, you know, again, it, it becomes not a problem for anybody but the guy who short the stock uh, initially, right? So initially they're they're losing millions and then they're losing you know hundreds of millions and they're losing billions. In the end, when it was all done, I think the shorts lost like thirty billion dollars on a stock that, when they started getting short, was a three hundred million dollar stock, right? So the most that they could make if the stock went to zero was three hundred million. And then a bunch of shorts put together lost something like 30 billion. And, you know, that's, that's bad for them. Obviously, that's a very bad situation for them. But if you think about how these things work in a, in a nonlinear fashion, especially in the options market, if the price had kept going, it wasn't going to go from, to a from a $30 billion loss to a $50 billion loss. There's definitely a possibility where that goes to a $300 billion loss. Now, it's not just a few people who've lost. It's not a couple of hedge funds that gone out of business. It's a threat to the system, right? So they, they end up having to shut down this activity because there's a systemic rift at a point where clearing firms and brokerages and are going to start, start to lose um, or start to go out of business. And, you know, again, this is all based on the fact that people are, are building models uh, based on past price activity and always assuming that there's like there's a margin of safety in there but when things go out you know blow outside of that margin it it is a threat and so um you you definitely have this kind of systemic risk built in that's why they have to you know they have to shut down trading right i mean that's what's funny is there's no limit like when you buy an option they say well you know the upside's unlimited well there is a limit and the limit is when the system becomes unstable they have to shut down the trading they have to shut down activity so, uh, you know, when, what, what my partner and I have been, have been working on is a system that is a derivative system, but where the, um, where actually there are in, inherent and, and explicit limits built into every contract. Everything that we do actually has a, a limit on how far it can go built into it. So there's no possibility of systemic risk from it, right? I mean, someone could lose all their money. Certainly a person could put a trade on and, and lose money on the trade. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it can't go beyond where uh, the, the, the trade is predefined, what those limits are at the beginning. So, um, and that's, a, you know, obviously a whole different rabbit hole to go down, to go down at some point. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you end up with these things that are, that are built this way. I mean, we've just seen it over and over again. I mean, what was it was long-term capital management in the late nineties. So these are, these are, you know, brilliant PhDs, like the guy who created the, you know, the model for valuing options that everyone uses was, you know, on their board. They're, 
brilliant guys. And what happens? They had to close the system. They had to close it down and take it over and liquidate it um, and pour money in because they were concerned about threats to the entire financial system created by that. So, so that for our, for our listeners that may not be concerned with or know a lot about options, just to give an example. Well, I think the way to think about it, there's two, there's two points. There's just the short position, right? You're going to, um, I'm going to go to my brokerage and I'm going to borrow the stock. I'm going to sell the stock that I borrowed. Now I'm going to owe that, that stock back. So that's a more straightforward one. And it's a kind of, kind of linear. Um, and you, you can, you look at that and say, okay, uh, you know, if the stock goes down, I'm going to, you know, if the stock goes out, company goes to business, the stock goes to zero. I'm going to make X number of dollars. Um, but if the price starts heading up, uh, then then I'm going to potentially lose. And you can get into a situation called a short squeeze, where essentially, and you know, I, I, I've seen this a few times. Um, a friend of mine and I were trading actually um, options on a company called Peabody Energy, which was essentially a coal company that did go bankrupt. But before the company went bankrupt, uh, the stock was trading at two dollars. And before they went bankrupt, they had a short squeeze where uh, people were short the stock. So they're borrowing the stock and the stock and they've sold the stock. They're going to owe the stock back. The price of the stock starts going up. Now, all of a sudden, uh, you know, so people start coming in and buying it and the price starts going up. And all of a sudden now, you know, they're potentially losing vastly more than what they could ever make on it. And so they, so these, you know, people who are short the stock have to run out and buy it so they can turn around and deliver it to the people they borrowed it from. And, and in doing so, they're driving up the price on the other guy who's short. Now he has to buy it and to, to, to deliver it. And it goes and goes and goes. So that was a stock that went from $2 to $7 in about, you know, in a, in a number of days, uh, then proceeded to go back down to $2. Um, they had a second short squeeze that happened a few months later. The stock went almost to 20 bucks again, back to $2, back to $1 and then into bankruptcy. And these guys who were short were all right. They were all correct that the stock was going to zero, but how many of them got hurt on the way? The, the other side of this is the options where let's say you buy the, you know, it's a $2 stock, you buy the $5 call. So what you have is the right to purchase the stock for $5 any time before the expiration of that option. Meanwhile, the guy who sold it to you has an obligation to sell you the stock at $5. Well, again, at two bucks, who cares? But when the price starts going up, uh, the, you know, the guy who sold you the $5 call now has an obligation to sell it to you at five bucks and maybe the stock's trading at eight or trading at 20. So what really happens on the, on the option side of that is you know he may be selling you that five dollar call for ten cents, but he may lose thirteen dollars on it. So there's vastly more leverage built into the option side of it. But again, it's because there's no there's no limit. It's not like oh we're betting whether the stock will be above or below five dollars. In which case you know we bet five dollars you could lose five bucks. But instead, what is happening is he's agreeing to sell it at that price, and as a result, there's there's no you know, there's no limit on how much you can lose. And the, and the reality is that those people who are selling those options are going to win 99% of the time, right? Or they're going to win even more than 99% of the time if the option is far enough out of the money. But it's what happens in the, you know, one out of 100, one out of 1,000 case where it becomes a problem. Interesting. So basically, in terms of options, the thing that seems to take it out of whack is human behavior. And that's what we were talking about is how do you manage risk? Well, the way you manage risk is not getting caught in the euphoria of human behavior. Because if you get caught in that delta, like where we are now in the market, where people are paying a thousand times earnings for Tesla or two ninety for Netflix, they, I mean, see that what that comes to is what Mara and I talk a lot about on this channel, which is if you understand. And I know options is is a little bit different because you're you're betting on a price going up or down, but in terms of just evaluating a company for dividend producing income, you're looking at straight up the cash flow. And that's why I think a lot of people are caught in these markets because they don't understand accounting or how to evaluate a business. So they're like, I'll pay a thousand for Tesla. Do you even know what that means? Yeah, they, they think I, I'll buy, I'll pay a thousand times earnings for, for uh, Tesla because I want to sell it at 2000 times earnings to someone else. To, yeah, to the next fool up. So that's, that's, yeah. that's where we are in terms of managing risk is, is 
most people don't even know what risk is. That's that's right, what the whole right. point is, and that's how they get caught in these these option trades that they get euphoric. They base their risk on the past, and they don't realize that that's not a smart way to base their risk. Well, I, actually, what's really funny is some of these cases. It's actually computer programs that are selling these options they shouldn't sell. I mean, I I have uh, gone in and and bought options for you know uh, pennies that. I mean, they should just never be valued at that. But someone's, you know, someone on a trading desk has programmed it. So it looks and, you know, makes an evaluation and says, oh, you know, this thing's only worth, this thing, this is worth zero. So I'm happy to sell it at two cents. And it's like, well, it's probably worth zero, but in some weird situation, it's worth five bucks. So you actually, uh, in many cases, have automated systems that are making the bad trades. Um, now, you you hope that those guys have, um, well, actually, I don't. Maybe you don't care, but you you hope that the, that they are all putting it into a model that's analyzing the overall risk of the portfolio, and they've got trades against those trades, which you know generally they probably do. Um, but I, but I think you're right. I think a lot of people don't uh, they don't analyze risk. I think it's a human tendency to think um, how much can I make, not how much I, can I lose. Um, you know, I I mean, yeah, I, and and I think <clears throat> I think. You know, sometimes people are actually too conservative. I mean, when you look at, um, you know, you're talking about the stock market and talking about these crazy multiples, but it's uh, it's denominated in dollars and they're making more dollars every day. So what's the correct multiple uh, when we don't know how many more of these dollars they're going to print? I never even thought about that. That's an interest. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you talk about cash flow, but cash flow, you know, it's again, it's it's dollars. And so what's happening is, you know, you're trying to measure something, but the yardstick is moving up and down in its length. So uh, I think that creates a, a real problem um, for, for any kind of fundamental analysis that you do. I mean, you'd probably be better off. You're probably better off than the guy who doesn't do any analysis. But um I mean, I remember having this conversation with someone about the stock market a year ago, and they're like, how can the stock market be going up when, you know, they've shut down the economy? I'm like, well, first of all, you know, what are the companies in the stock market? And it's, you know, it's the Amazons and it's the McDonald's and it's the Facebooks. It's those guys. And those guys aren't being shut down. But the other side of it is simply that these are all denominated in dollars and they're making more dollars every day. And I don't think we're coming out of this cycle where they're going to spend and they're going to print to spend. I mean, more money is more money that's being spent out of Washington is printed than taxed. Um, and given the you know legislation that's working its way through right now, it seems like that's that trend is going to continue. Um, and then you have to look at how much the overall debt is, what's the service on that debt, uh, and are you know is there an out clause on that? Do you grow your way out of that at any point? And I'm not really sure whether you do or not. I mean, that boat might have sailed, in which case you're looking at the numerator on all of these investments, again, is going to be something that there's going to be more and more of. There's going to be more and more dollars. And so, you know, I, I don't know what the right valuation is. Points to one thing. When the government come and get gets involved or comes and gets involved, yeah. it messes it up. So from a standpoint of shutting things down, you're, you're not going to be able to make revenue. And then on the flip side, when they're pumping too much money into the system, you're right. With inflation and your purchasing value of your dollar, you're like, well, I'm making this dividend that's 2% or 3%, but I, I, I can't spend it on anything because it's it's so low. So it's like the yardstick keeps moving. So you're in this quandary. You know, For us, Mario and myself as a value investor, we're waiting for this thing to come apart, but we're like, man, they just keep pumping and pumping. So, they all, so the situation, yeah, these, these things, the situation that we're in is that that like we're starting to talk about in this podcast is a better quality investors nowadays is not only investing, he's buying a business or he's starting his own business like you are. So it's, it's having that whole skill set and then preservation of capital. It's having like we're in the past. It was just like Warren Buffett. I just like kind of invest and buy, but now it's like the well-rounded investor. It's like, well, there's nothing to buy or invest in. So I'm just going to start my own business. Right. If you have a flow of cash, if you have a flow of cash from your business, obviously that's the greatest value. And if that and if that cash flow will go up with inflation, then that's obviously extremely extremely valuable as well. Um, I, I 
there's a, a book people should read. Uh, I always tell everyone to read this. It's a book called When Money Dies by a guy named Adam Ferguson came out about 10 years ago. And it's about the about the German hyperinflation in the 20s and um, how everyone thought they were getting rich at first because the stock market was going crazy and the prices of things were going up and everyone's everyone was thinking, wow, this is terrific. We're we're I'm richer than I've ever been. And of course, what you were they were rich in were these marks that were about to become completely useless. And so it, it, it's very strange to think that these things can happen. But the when you look at a currency issued by a government, um, th a lot of them have failed. Uh, it, it seems almost as though, right. I mean, the dollar has not gone to zero yet, um, but it has gone. It, yeah, except, well, a lot of them ha have, right. There's a very, very large number of uh, fiat currencies issued by governments that have gone to zero. And you're right. If you have a business that provides cash flow, then hopefully, you know, if that cash flow is, you know, a hundred thousand dollars today, but, Maybe someday it's a hundred million dollars because the dollar's not worth as much, but at least you've got a, you know some bit of a partial hedge built in there. So yeah, so I mean, that's the challenge we're dealing with today. So coming to the last question, question which is how do you create freedom in this unfree world? It's, I think it's really right. about, <laughs> it's about right here. It's it's about getting this on thinking because a lot of it we're is dealing with so many. Basically, what they're doing for for people listening to this podcast is they're not allowing us to go out and build businesses the way we could build businesses, meaning not restricting revenue, right. keeping the monetary supply at a, at a normal level. They're monkeying with all that stuff. So now you have this hybrid business environment. It's not full capitalism. They lie. They say it is. It isn't. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how do you create freedom in your mind in that world when you have all these like the government basically preventing you from doing business. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, there, obviously there, there's a lot of, you know, different parts of that. I, I mean, I, I honestly tell people they should buy some Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Um, they should, they should learn about it. They should buy some, um, they should learn to keep it off exchanges in their own wallet that they control, um, so that they're somewhat more independent of all of this. Um, you know, keep some cash, uh, I think people need to learn about decentralized finance. It's a whole area. It's, uh, it's strange. It's new. Um, and it, it takes, it does take some research to try to figure out how this stuff works. Um, but I think, I think it's, I think it's worth people's, uh, effort to learn about that. I mean, I remember sitting down with some friends, let's see, I think it was about nine months ago. Um, and these are all people who've been successful in business. They have money. And we were, we're talking and, and I just said, okay, look, you know, I'm going to interrupt for a second and just say this and then you can go back to everything, go back to what you're doing. But I said, it is irresponsible for any of you not to own some Bitcoin. If you're sitting here and you're, you know, I mean, now I'm, you know, I'm at a different stage in life than you are, but I, you know, a lot of friends who are either retiring or going to retire in a little while. And, um, and, uh, you know, they're sitting on, on, you know, cash and stocks and it's like, you, you, you need to, they need to start thinking about having some alternatives in there. And so what I said to them, this, this group of people is, you know, look, I know you're probably not going to do it, but it's irresponsible for you not to own any Bitcoin. And I would suggest you go out and figure out, maybe put 5% of your money in it or 2% or something, get some knowledge about this, start learning about these new things. Um, of course, none of them did it. And that was when the price was about 11,000 and now it's, you know, 40,000, um, you, you, and you know, then when the price drops from 60 to 30, everyone says, oh my God, it's too risky. And it's like, look, you, the, yes, this, this is something that's risky, but the volatility is on the surface. You can look at it and you know, if you put, you know, if you got a million dollars and you put $10,000 in Bitcoin, you, yeah, okay, you might lose $10,000. But if you've got, you know, bonds and, you know, regular financial assets, I mean, what's going to happen to you in a hyperinflationary environment? So I think people need to, I think people need to start looking at these alternatives and, and start looking at things like Bitcoin um, uh, and, and learning about, you know, uh, different, different types of, of finance than what they're used to. I think the other thing I really suggest is stay healthy. Um, again, you're at a different you're at a different phase in life than I am, but 
Um, there's a point where, you know, I mean, the wheels start to come off if you don't do anything about it. And I mean, when all this stuff started happening with COVID, one of the first things that I remember learning was uh, having too high a blood sugar, maybe type 2 diabetes, that was very dangerous. Having very low vitamin D levels, that's very dangerous, right? So, um, you know, I just started slamming vitamin D and trying to make sure I wasn't eat too, eating too many carbs. Um, and when COVID got around to me and to my wife, um, it was, you know, it was a bad cold. Um, but I would rather do, I would rather do that than be dependent on a health system, um, where people are on, you know, tons and tons of, of drugs and, and, you know, all this stuff, all these pharmaceuticals all the time where you're now, you know, you're dependent on, you know, keeping the, keeping the job that keeps you the health insurance that keeps you the, the, the drugs that keep you healthy rather than making yourself healthy. Because if you're healthy and like you said, you've got an open mind and you, you're using your brain and you put some money in some things that will be, uh, they'll be safe in a, you know, in a downturn or, or at least will be diversified. You're going to be able to, to think more clearly. And I mean, it's hard to think clearly when you're exhausted and on pharmaceuticals all the time. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree with you because I was building this site beforehand called Eating with Ellis, and it was all focused on sourcing your food locally. And I know a oh, lot wow. of local farmers here in Los Angeles mm -hmm. who are who are all from like Fresno, Bakersfield, because they bring all the food down to LA. Right. And ever since I started eating organic food, really focused on organic food, probably in two thousand and I would say twelve is mm -hmm. when I started doing. It. I started in the valley in Sherman Oaks area, there's a farmer's market I go to on Sunday. It, it just uh -huh. re revolutionized my mind, my life. And I stopped drinking coffee. That was a huge one. I don't know if you wow. drink coffee still. No, no, I, I haven't gotten off of that I, one. <laughs> I, 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 I stopped coffee because it was just too much. It was too much of this. Right. And that, right. that was a huge, and then I stopped drinking a lot. So I, I only do about two drinks a month. Oh wow! And with all those different things in place, it just like, because if you have all this money, like you said, but your health isn't there and you're dependent on these pharmaceuticals, which have so many side effects and you can get everything you need from nature. It's, it's just yeah. such a powerful force. It's like, yeah. So I think what you're saying is right. Instead of going out here to grab something for freedom, that's, that's a, a mirage. Look within yourself and what's around you, like your mindset, eating healthier, exercising, and then, and then obviously thinking about the financial system in this decentralized man, I'm going to start checking that out. The decentralized yeah. financial systems. That's pretty fascinating. Well, I, I, you know, I would, um, having been in, in trading and then also in tech, I've, uh, I've also talked to a lot of people who were, you know, uh, at startups and play and, and things and, uh, who made a lot of money and, uh, either made a lot of money or made and lost a lot of money in like technology stocks. And one of the things that I noticed was like a trader will, like if you have a stock that goes from a dollar to a hundred dollars, the trader, you know, he's probably not going to own it a buck. He's going to buy it somewhere along the way up and he's probably going to sell it somewhere on the way up or on the way down from a hundred. He's going to miss the top. He's going to miss the bottom. Um, the tech guy, a lot of times will know about it earlier because he knows the technology. He buys it at a dollar. And if he believes in it, he'll ride it all the way up to a hundred. Unfortunately, He'll also, because he believes in it, often write it from 100 down to one again, if that's you know, if that turns out to be their traje trajectory. And one of the pieces of advice I gave to a, a friend was sell some. And the reason I said sell some was when you if you've got an investment and you're wondering where you should get out and you sell a little bit of it, what happens is your brain turns back on. And it just goes back to what you were saying, right? It's this thing where you need to do things that will keep your brain running. Because a lot of times we get paralyzed by fear. You get the, you know, uh, what is it? The, you know, analysis paralysis where you start just trying to think it much, through too much. You just get too worried. You take your risk down a little bit. You do a few things that, you know, help you uh, feel a little bit more comfortable. And then your brain turns back on because that's ultimately what you're going to have to have. You're going to have to be able to do your own thinking and, uh, you know, and be able to make your own decisions. And you can't do that if you're panicked. And you can't do that if you're unhealthy, right? So it, it makes sense to do these things that, that you know, get your, keep your brain working. So, yeah, so those are great points. And on closing, Peter, what do you think are some high profit margin 
industries that are coming along in AI, Bitcoin? What do you think are going to be those those businesses using this technology that are going to produce like these 20, 30, 40% margin businesses? Any thoughts on that? You know, I, I have to say, I don't know if I can really answer um, in terms of high margin business. I mean, having been in trading and options, um, I've kind of always been uh, someone who owns the like winger out of the money kind of stuff that makes the 30, 40, 50 X returns rather than the things that make the, the higher margins. Um, so I might be the wrong guy to look at uh, to go to on that. Um, but I do think, I mean, for me, it's more about having uh, some of my money in something very safe and then having some of the money in things that are risky, but have the possibility of exceptional rewards. Right. So, um, I think about, you know, in the crypto sphere, um, getting into Ethereum very early and um, having, uh, like I said, I, I always tell people like every sale for the first three years was a really bad idea. Uh, buying it was great, but every single sale was bad because, it, you know, the, the, the returns were ridiculous. Um, so I would suggest to people that they um, do, do look into decentralized finance, some of the stuff that's going on there. There are things that are creating yield. Um, there are also, I mean, there's, there's a lot of risk in it too. So don't, you know, this isn't the kind of thing to go into with 90% of your money. It might be the thing to go in with 9% of your money. Um, but it, but it is an area where you can potentially be looking at the beginnings of a new financial system. If we end up going that way and, and being one of the, um, being, we're still at a point where if you learn it, you might be one of the, you know. Uh, one of the early people, one of the people who's, uh, you know, I mean, there's certainly people earlier than than we are, um, but you might be one of the people who 10 years from now, people say, oh, wow, you got into that then. That's great. That's really smart. So, you know, there's a possibility of learning a lot in an area that's growing um, and, you know, it might, that might turn out to be, uh, you know, good investment, mostly just for the education. Yeah, I think those are great points. I, I actually think that decentralized finance would be a high, highly profitable business because it's it doesn't require a lot. It just requires like software, it requires an exchange, it requires security, it requires servers, energy, and those are those are like if you look at most software companies, they have eighty percent gross margins. Like Oracle, they're in, insanely profitable. Yeah, so so I, yeah, I, you, thank you for sharing with us. And, and our listeners, this decentralized finance, because I never really honed into that before. When you kind of said it, I was like, I kind of understood that we were going decentralized, but I didn't realize there was a realm called decentralized finance. So that's that's fascinating. Thank you for that share. Of course, of course. Yeah, and thank you for your time. I wish Mario could have been on the call with us, but... Yeah, I look forward to talking to him at some point in the future. Yeah. Yeah, let's do this again. I really appreciate your time. Mm-hmm.